and welcome to Wednesday's version of the PT on Ice Daily Show. My name is Christina Previtt. I am on faculty with my partner in crime, Dustin Jones, looking at modern management of the older adult and geriatric physical therapy in general. We have a really exciting couple of weeks coming up. Um, we are in the middle of our modern management of the older adult online cohort. We are deep diving into the exercise prescription piece, which we must say is probably where our bias lies, though all of it is really important. And then this weekend, uh, Dustin and I are heading to Casper, Wyoming to go to Wind City Physical Therapy um, to be working with the crew over there, which is super, super exciting. Um, if you hear my dog crying in the background, it's because he really wants to play and he is obviously begging for attention. So I'm really sorry if you hear some of the crying sounds in the background. Okay, so today I thought that we would talk a little bit around balance prescription. So if you've been following the podcast a lot, especially in the geriatric side of things, you will notice that we put a lot of emphasis on functional strength training. And I think one really important piece to some of this functional work is the balance component. And so there has been a lot of work that has been done in falls prevention. We all know the statistics that one in three older adults over the age of 65 fall each year, that falls, especially injurious falls, lead to prolonged hospitalization, decline in functional status, loss of independent living, decrease in quality of life, et cetera, et cetera. And so we know that this is a big deal. And so there has been a lot of research that has gone into what is the best thing to do about it. And oftentimes it's the strength training and balance training exercise prescription portion um, that physical therapists kind of tackle. And so in school, I remember we learned all about the balance system. We always were taught that there are the three systems. We have the visual system, the proprioceptive system, and the vestibular system. And these three things work in concert to help a person stay upright and allow a person to maintain focus and potentially have, um, if impaired, to affect falls risk. And so as I was thinking about some of the prescriptions that we generally use, I was thinking that sometimes we can probably get a little bit boring in our exercise prescription for balance. And I've talked about this before, how, you know, we tend to have our go-tos like uh, marching on the spot and, and different um, permutations of stepping patterns and marching patterns. And I was thinking about my own biases towards balance training and wondering if I was actually doing enough when it came to balance. Do we know what changes with age across the three systems? And that I actually wasn't really that sure in terms of some of the changes in the vestibular system. Um, we know that we have loss of uh, visual acuity as we get older and that our proprioceptive drive is a lot lower, that our joint position sense is lower. But I didn't know that we lose 20% of our hair cells in the, uh, I'm going to butcher the names, uh, in some of the vestibular organs, I'm not even going to try. I'm like that person that tries to explain anatomy and then sometimes I say it in the wrong way. Um, so we lose 20 to 40% of our hair cells, which means that we don't have the same ability for the vestibular ocular reflex, which is the reflex that when we turn our head, keeps something central in our vision and can lead to vestibular impairment. And there was actually a study that was done um, in, I'm, I'm blanking on the city, uh, in a spot in the U.S., it was a U.S.-based study that looked at people who had had a fall and measured a bunch of physical outcome measures and realized that over 80% of them had a vestibular impairment that may have contributed to their falls. And so something that we need to be thinking about. And so with ICE, we always think, you know, what are some of these things that we can change and are we properly screening for these impairments to make sure that we are doing the proper thing by our clients. And so when we were looking, I was looking at different outcome measures and the ones that we see a lot are um, the Berg balance and the activity specific balance confidence scale, the ABC scale. And for any of my clients or any of my clinicians, sorry, that are in uh, outpatient orthopedics, my one issue with the Berg, not that it's a bad test, is that my clients who are coming in who do have some probably subclinical or preclinical manifestations of balance impairment are topping up on the Berg. They're hitting a ceiling. They are passing it with flying colors. 
but I, I can see that they're having some issues with their balance. And so the question was, now what do we do to try and address those things if we aren't testing that necessarily with the bird balance? And so one of the tests that I used in some of my randomized control trials, and then I actually really enjoy using is the mini best test. And so the mini best test is, uh, it has four subscales and it tests dynamic, static, reactive, and different postural control uh, subcategories of balance. And I think that's where we as PTs, me self-admittedly, um, fall weak. We, we don't really necessarily really deep dive into where a person's balance breaks down and then how we can fix it. And so when I started conceptualizing different balance strategies in my head, I started breaking them down into different subsections. So do we have an individual standing in front of us who has issues with static balance? If yes, that's probably the lowest hanging fruit and we need to start there. Are they pretty good standing on their two feet, but when they're doing dynamic things, like a lot of times falls will happen from, uh, in terms of sitting or standing and going into a forward acceleration because of some of the issues with their vestibular system. And that change in acceleration can throw them off balance. So is it something dynamic in nature? And if, so they pass dynamic, or sorry, they pass static, don't pass dynamic, okay, then we need to target there. Are they pretty good with some of their stepping patterns, which tends to be my 60 plus group that I see in outpatient? You know, they can do great binds and, and potentially not have that much issues with them. Sometimes they do when I narrow their base of support. But when I start doing reactive balance strategies, which is the third part of the mini best test, where I'm actually getting them to lean in different um, directions, backwards, forward, side to side. And as they lean and they're starting to get their center of mass closer to the edge of their base of support, and then I let go, guarding, obviously, I'm not getting my clients to fall, but if I am trying to pull that perturbation and they're step, 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 or they're staggering or I'm catching them, then their reactive control is probably where I need to be targeting. And so if they've passed static, passed dynamic, but they're not passing the reactive styles of balance or the reactive tests of balance, then I need to start put, putting a lot of my emphasis and a lot of my focus there. And then the fourth subsection that I've seen a lot in the literature is dual tasking. And so are they good if you were getting them to do like a hallway walk but as soon as you start to get them to navigate obstacles while you're talking to them, their, their, um, their performance noticeably declines, then I might be working on more of a cognitive training style and I may be adding more, um, you know, try counting backwards from 37 by three while also trying to navigate this obstacle course. And these are higher levels of balance training, something that's very important for cognitive demand and maintaining our ability to stay on our feet. Because we do know that a person who, as they get older, has a harder time filtering information, especially when it's coming from multiple directions. And so some of our balance tests are very isolated, they're very concentrated, and our older adults pass with flying colors. And then they go out in the community where they're navigating obstacles. They probably have somebody that they're with that they're talking to. They are trying to navigate when a car is passing. Can they safely uh, get across the street? Are they going to be walking fast enough? Are they holding on to an object? And these higher level cognitive tasks that are putting a huge stress and strain on them physically as well as on their balance systems is where we start seeing them having these falls and these issues. And that is probably where we need to be training and can we do a better job? And so I really started thinking about this. And so that's why I love the mini best because it also has a reactive uh, gait stability. So you're getting a person to walk in a straight line and then you're saying left and they have to very quickly shift to their left. I think this is your left uh, on the screen. I'm going opposite because I have somebody staring at me, but you know, I do know my left right. <laughs> um, so you have them to shift very quickly and that type of training can really sometimes throw them off because there's an, a sudden uh, perturbation or sudden cognitive load change and all of a sudden they need to react to that. And so those are some of the things that we can do in order to be properly assessing for balance and where balance breaks down, especially if somebody's coming to you 
with a fall that isn't just like a, a non-impact fall. It's something that was relatively um, like a slip on ice or something. We're looking at different types of balance out in the community. Something that we can do as clinicians just try and really think through where along the balance continuum are, are people starting to break down and where can we target our interventions to get the best bang for their buck. Because I know that I've been guilty in the past of just kind of going through a soliloquy of steps where, okay, can they stand in tandem? Can they go semi-tandem? Can they, where do they, where do they go? Can they go on single leg stand? Can we do those? But I haven't necessarily pushed them further into dynamic balance unless they're with me one-on-one -on -one, or I haven't tried reactive balance strategies. And so as I've been implementing that more into my practice lately, I've one, been able to notice right when the amount of cognitive demand or the amount of demand on their bodily systems reaches a threshold where we're trying to really push past that and see improvements and where at boomer and where do we start to see those improvements translate over into uh, community living and potentially contribute to an increased confidence and independence in day-to-day -day, um, tasks as well as community interaction. And so that's just something that I've been thinking about over the last little while. And we've been building that out for the live course so that we have a good framework in mind for clinicians who are working with older adults to be able to identify where the flaws are and target interventions right to the needs and demands of the client that is standing in front of you. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that PTN ACE. Um, balance training is something that can be kind of boring to talk about, but when we do really cool things like our reactive control is more like a, a Simon Says or red light, green light or, or Zumba or something, um, we can make balance training really fun and we can really create that therapeutic alliance and really create things that our clients are going to want to do. And so definitely things that we can do to improve as clinicians in this area, myself included, and uh, something that I hope that we can talk about a little bit more in the future. All right. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. If you are in Casper, Wyoming this weekend, then we will see you there. Otherwise, have a very, very happy Wednesday, and I will see you next week. Bye.